Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for the second in my series on the independent bookstores of the San Diego area. If you're new to my channel, I'm Roderick Long. I teach philosophy at Auburn University in Alabama. I'm also involved with uh, a, con a conjoined pair of anarchist think tanks, the Molinari Institute and the Center for a Stateless Society. But specifically for the purposes of this series, I'm also a displaced San Diegan and I'm uh, that's why I'm interested in doing this uh, this series on on uh, on San Diego bookstores because most San Diego travel videos uh, don't really give the impression that there's a interesting indie bookstore scene in San Diego and there definitely is. Um, you know, so this next one is with uh, uh, Look Books, uh, which is um, a uh, a once in future. Uh, uh, San Diego area bookstore. I'll be, we'll be talking about that. Um, and uh, you know, I've just you know, just finished recording this. I'm recording the introduction before, af after I've recorded the actual interview. And I think this interview is likely to be one of the most interesting ones in the series. Uh, you know, who knows? I mean, this is only the second one. Maybe there'll be uh, uh, other um uh, one's equally uh, interesting, um, but, and th this one I think is gonna be interesting uh, and not just people who are interested in, you know, in San Diego bookstores, but um, people who are interested in uh, um, in uh, bookstores generally in, you know, in art and literature and, uh, and so on generally. In fact, this, you know, this could, uh, this video could plausibly go in either the, um, you know, the San Diego bookstore series or just in my regular interviews with interesting people series. I guess I'll put it in the San Diego bookstore series, but um, uh, no, this is really gonna be, uh, anyway, so I, uh, uh, I think this is gonna be a really interesting um, interview for people to watch. Um, and uh, here it comes. Anyway, because you had yeah. success with your uh, tree hunting. Yeah, it was crazy. It was really cool because I literally had an easel set up and I was building a funky uh, uh, like anti-Christmas tree. And then this guy helped out and took us way deep in the forest and had a permit and everything and had been like, uh, you know, fourth generation local. So he knew all the backwoods, but that also why it took so much longer, but. Um, so what's an anti tree? Thing? Well, it was, it was literally, I had like a, a single pillar easel that I was just like putting to like putting together. There was no, there was no, I was gonna just hang ornaments and decorate oh, this easel. So. If I would, if I had known that would happen, I had in my bookstore, I had done like a six foot tall, um, no, no, it's like seven foot tall, it's taller than me, um, a book tree, like, and there was all, I had all really cool, like color coordinated, mostly red and green and a few like gold books, like stacked in a nice, nice big tall pyramid with a typewriter and everything. Cool. It's actually, yeah. So. Well, anyway, I guess I should, I should, uh, you know, tell my viewers uh, what we're doing now. Uh, so um, uh, this is Sean Christopher. 
uh, who's the um, uh, the head of a once and possibly future San Diego bookstore. Uh, it's Look Books. It's Look spelled L H O O Q. If you're a student of art history, you'll get the reference. And if you're not, well, we'll we're probably going to talk about it. Also known as uh, Look X Realism, it's formerly located in uh, Carlsbad, uh, up in uh, North San Diego County. Um, uh, currently moved to uh, Astoria, Oregon, but uh, uh, there are prospects for reopening something uh, in the San Diego area once again. So, uh, Sean, tell me your story. Tell me the story of this this bookstore. There's you know the the websites for it. The the main website and the Facebook page look really interesting, and I've got uh, I will have links in the description to. Great, yeah. The the website was a really a uh, creation of my wife, but she wanted to reflect the um, kind of the intimacy of being of the store, like trying to have a have a have a actual uh, ephemeral reaction, to, like that was. It, it's actually very technically difficult like she built it from scratch but it uh, but it looks rustic almost mm -hmm. i guess you could say you know has that feeling so that was that was that's all her and only problem though it's been kind of on hold for two reasons one she's stuck in europe because of the pandemic and her equipment is all in my, our office here like her <laughs> computer's right there she's stuck here and um and also because we were doing the relocation we didn't want to announce anything until we would ha had everything finalized and official like so we didn't have we were waiting kind of to like do the formal launch on relaunch at least on the website um but as far as the bookstore um you know i had to think about a lot so actually it's a good time that we talked today because uh, last night and this morning i was working on the final proposal about how we were going to go about um the bookstore here and or and the nonprofit which emerged to a cultural center and what we're also working on doing back down in san diego county and um i guess one of the things i would think i could share maybe more uniquely for the just the independent bookstore industry at, at a whole was understanding you know what the importance of an independent bookstore and uh, what it, what were its values more than its product. Because to be honest, when it came down to the product there and you know, the business of, a, of an independent bookstore where everyone's dealing with serious issues and it's not going to get any better. It's, it may, it's going to get different. It may, you know, but it's not, it's not going to get better if you stick to an old formula. So um, I got into, I, I followed kind of, it was, there is some secular like journeys uh, with the business of the, of the, at least the bookstore part of it, because I started off getting interested in, in books in my early teens and was just became obsessed so obsessed that I chose to quit professional skateboarding to pursue a career in writing and the arts. And I headed off on a one-way ticket to Europe at 18 years old. And it was all for the pursuit of the adventure of the story. And, um, and I traveled in Europe for over two years and I didn't come home for maybe four, almost about three and a half years altogether. So I went to Europe too, then came back to New York and that felt like home after being in New York for two years. But, and even in my writing, I wrote about how bookstores were my churches. So when I was traveling, I was lonely. I'd go to, instead of going to a church, I'd go to a bookstore and I would, and my saints and angels were the authors and the characters in, in, all the novels I've written. So that's who I literally prayed with and talked to and had comfort in where I felt most comfortable. So there was that side of it. And then also as 
um, you know, just being a young, young kid pursuing the arts and then also going through academia. It just was absolutely natural that a bookstore was part of the development of, of creativity and, and intelligence, like the intellectual pursuit, the philosophical pursuit, and the artistic pursuits throughout history. Uh, uh, you know, um, and it's just one of those places, an intellectual salon or a cafe. And that's where I realized that's what needs to be protected, presented, protected, and preserved was that that concept that what what the bookstore represented and so that's how i started evolving and i even went from going the first business i had was an online bookstore i it bas basically i didn't inherit but took over uh, a business a book the business it was a former professor of mine and he was uh very intelligent, really neurotic. He was working on a second PhD. He was a full-time professor working on a second PhD and he owned a bookstore. And um, so by the time I got involved, he, he asked me to help him save the bookstore, but it was um, just a too little too late. Um, so the physical bookstore was gone or going, but uh, I ended up taking his inventory and his contacts and, 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 and getting and learning a lot from him about just being a wholesale buyer and selling retail and having connections and networking and learning the, the business side of, of selling books. Um, then a few years later, I opened a bookstore and as I start, as I was transitioning and building my bookstore, there was also the transition of the Amazon going from pretty user friendly, pretty pretty successful financially. Pretty, it was a, a place where you could um, sell books at your own pace, at your own time, make good money. Um, they were pretty much just middlemen, and it was great as a writer because I was. I had to take a job at any time. And sometimes it was a couple of days notice to go off and be gone for two weeks or, you know, somewhere in between that. And I couldn't do that with um, a part time, any kind of job. You know, so I needed something that would work with that. And so that's how it started. But then as I actually opened the physical store that was over a course of years and like say the 2008, when we were at our worst economic kind of second worst now uh, pretty bad time economically and, and it also coincided with the rise of audiobooks digital books and and the online market was just booming and amazon was becoming more uh overbearing and restrictive yeah and i I've, I've, I've sold stuff on amazon and yeah it's gotten worse and worse and worse yeah and i ultimately boycotted i i i consciously stepped away from selling on on amazon and online completely for a while um of course i still network and sell online to my but people but with relationships that I'd already developed like especially collectors and whatnot um and we do have uh we had a website that had our e-commerce set up like when it was scarce squarespace but now that we have our new site um, that whole inventory didn't transfer over and this, this is so they did it on purpose so that you couldn't, um, transfer the inventory. So we, we are going to still sell online, but our primary purpose really is to, um, and, and it's been, and it was, it was a working formula was to create the bookstore intellectual salon and, and cultural center. And, and really, and even like a museum in a way. And I think that's really helped. And it's, we've, we've actually evolved. Like we have, we went from a, a tiny building that was just nothing to, um, we have, well, 
we have 22,000 square feet to work with. Not all of it is going to be the bookstore. Some of it will be a gallery and um, a, a venue and a little art house theater and, and, a, and a recording studio, but it, it's mainly still the, the central main room and entrance to all that is look books, which is a bookstore. And, and it really goes off the traditions of you know, Shakespeare and Co. Um, the city lights and everything in between in that world. So can you tell me the story, both the story of the, the Carlsbad store and then the story of, of the, you know, the Astoria store and then, you know, whatever um, story you think might be coming. It was kind of, it, it's, I'm strangely saying it in an optimist way, but there was, it was a pretty crazy uh, journey because um, I found an old building and, and I was looking for a retail space. Um, it was a, it, obviously it's expensive in coast, coastal Southern California. Um, and I found what basically was a, a, just a dilapidated, nearly condemned warehouse kind of workshop building in the village. Um, and I came from, from, a generations of builders. I have a grandfather, four uncles and a stepfather, all in some field of building, mostly construction. I put myself through grad school as a finished carpenter. So it's like, okay, I'm going to act. I physically built the bookstore. It took me a year. And, uh, I also, there was principles too. I didn't want to take any business loans or use any credit. I wanted to build as my means could provide. Um, and it did take about a year to actually build the bookstore and have our, get to our grand opening. And uh, then uh, a few, few weeks we are open soft opening for a couple of months and then a few weeks after a grand opening as a bookstore and a, and a legitimate nonprofit uh, we were shut down by the city and um, it ultimately there was a lot of different reasons the reasons changed but ultimately came down to building use um, because we had our license we had our permit we had our insurance but they, for some reason, they, they misjudged who we were and what we were trying to do in the beginning, the, at least the city did. And so they just, they just thought we, they could shut us down with a pretty superficial reason. Um, so it came down to building use because we were zoned properly, but then because it was an old building that I had renovated, uh, they were trying to say, is this, it was zoned, it was, in a in a in a um, survey done in the early 90s the survey was actually fired by the city but they had designated it as a as a residential um, space uh, garage when it wasn't um, so i had to prove that otherwise and it actually took me 18 months to get reopened after i just had spent a year investing into the place um, then we opened, then we had a solid run for a few years and it took a while because we were evolving from a bookstore to a cultural center and, um, it was very inclusive. So we went from having, uh, you know, of course we had readings and, and, uh, you know, poetry nights and. But then we had lectures and we had uh, political uh, activists, intellectuals doing discussions. Uh, and this is kind of before the even the Sam Harris's and the Jordan Peterson's of the world were, do, were starting that. Um, so we were kind of on in that leading in that direction. Even we're doing that with a screen and a projector which led us to even having um, art house movie nights because we didn't have any, even uh, even Landmark had shut down by then. So we had, didn't have much art house cinema either. Um, 
And then we even started having uh, shows and real, not just background music, but real present, like real uh, music events. So you come for the for the event. Yeah, and I and saw they, some of the, the videos of the of the uh, the concerts on on one of those on one of your sure. uh, the, the, it, it, very diverse range of performances. Oh yeah, we went from from noise to classical violin and everything in between. And that was on very conscious. It was just, we wanted artists of all mediums and we just really wanted them to, we, I always said to everyone that performed or, or did a workshop or taught, I said, just doesn't matter if there's one person there, 20 or 200, just do your absolute best and it'll reflect on and and it'll it'll you'll get it back in return somehow and and it also will raise the status of our venue and reputation and it's just but it's a win-win because uh, if even if it's a small venue if you if you get a point where people recognize that there's real talent being shown or put on display, whether it be, you know, visual art or music or writing or it right. And you have to real the artists would come in knowing I have to raise the bar and really be at my best. It helped everyone involved. And another thing we did as a nonprofit was to make sure that we gave all net profits to the artist. So instead of other venues that were, you know, it's usually the the performers and and the quote unquote talent would get paid the last and the least, and we would reverse that. We pay them the most first and the most, and then you know, we take it from there. So that that became a big part of what we did, and and what part of what we're doing. And what kind of books did or do you carry? Um, I try to get every genre and every nonfiction subject, but just the the absolute best. And and I do two a few things where, um, for one, absolutely no filler, no filler whatsoever on any shelf. I, I want to know why every book is there, and or have someone that's an expert that knows why that book is there and explain to me why this is the right book. Um, a good simple example is say there's a how many how many biographies are there on Lincoln, you know hundreds, you know maybe more, maybe thousands, and I'd say I want to I want the the most respected you know accurate historically accurate one, and I want the one that is has the most unknown information like information that you never heard about, but it was also as as um, sound as could be, like as you know, fact based as they could get it. That's kind of a way I went about each thing. So, and also, just like a lot of any of from music and, and any art is you you just peeling the onion. So you have some uh, a book or an author that someone likes, and you find their influences, and you show share their influences, and then you find th those person's influences, and then you get those books, and to the point where you find the really most obscure and interesting books you can. A good example is that on a that people could relate to is say, Oscar Wilde and Dorian and Dorian Gray. Well, if they read that, then they need to know about J.K. Huseman's and Against Nature or Au Revoir's. Um, which was both Oscar Wilde's Bible, in a, in a, which I think he actually called it, and he even put it in um, uh, Dorian Gray. It was his favorite book as well in in the story. And if you read uh, Aubrey Wars, or it's often against, sometimes against the grain, but mostly against nature, by J.K. Huseman, so, uh, it's pretty, basically the prototype for Dorian Gray. And then in there, he's got references to, you know, some Greek and Roman uh, authors that were from the elite class that lived with the, on the streets wh where everyone was illiterate and, but they were literate. So they lived the life of a peasant and then wrote about it. And then, to, and then, so we would search and find those books 
and then have those. And then that leads to the next part, which was really trying to make those kind of books, get those books that were the best content, but, uh, but accessible. So we wanted them priced fair. We wanted, we want, we didn't want just rare collectibles. We definitely had those and that was a personal interest it's, it's neat to have a, a rare first a true first edition um but we we it was more about the content we wanted to share the content and and we weren't discriminated we wanted history we wanted science we wanted from religion it went from the you know the main main religions to the occult to pagan to wicca to Christianity, to Muslim, and you have the Quran, you have the Torah, you have just every every section we had, we wanted to go as far as we could with accurate information and, and interesting information. And how did you come up with the name of the story? Or the name? That, co like, that comes from my... The LA um, Q and you've got the uh, X-Realism. Yeah. About. Well, they're, they both are pretty personal. And um, look uh, comes from just my artist side. Um, Marcel Duchamp, the you know one of the basically the primary member of the Dada movement, that is the big brother to the Surrealist, which was a, which was at the Surrealists were a literary movement before they were, most people know them as an artist art visual art movement, but. They were a literary movement primarily and firstly and primarily they were it was about writing and um then so da, so marcel duchamp who was more of an artist so i just he was one of those figures that his philosophy on life and art was just to me that was it's still to this day is just one of the most interesting so that so one of his most iconic uh, pieces was um, he took just a I think it was just a postcard of the Mona Lisa and drew a mustache and a goatee on her and he wrote uh, an acronym L H O O Q um, and what was interesting about that acronym is that people are aware of the French translation, if you say L-H-O-Q in French, it sounds a lot like she has a nice arse mm -hmm. in, in English. L-H-O-O-Q, she has heat at the ass, literally. Yeah, okay, there you go, perfect. Yeah, you know it better. Um, and then it's a play on words, because in English it's look, so look, then she has a hot fire ass, but then there's also, um, and this could be, debatable, but in our research in college, there was some other languages that referred to his, his sexual ambiguity. And there's basically five languages that, that phonetically played into something that related to him, art, and art. And, and I, I just thought that was pretty genius and fascinating. And so there's where... a follow-up to it called LHOOQ Shaved, which is just Mona Lisa without the mustache, um, okay. which is, uh, you know, which is sort of treating the original Mona Lisa as though it's a modification of his, <laughs> of his work, which is, you know, sort of a nice little. Uh, nice. Uh, Very good. Uh, it, yeah. it, in a way, it's sort of, you know, it's, it reminds me sort of like, you know, Nino Borges' uh, Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. Sure. Yeah, so it, it reminds me a bit of that, of treating like, uh, you know, um, uh, I guess it's sort of an inversion of that, since in, in that one we're treating, uh, um, but it's it's something like that. It's sort of treating, uh, just as Borges treats uh, this text of of uh, Cervantes rewritten by someone else as though it's a whole new work. So, you know, LHOQ Shave treats Treats the original Mona Lisa as though it's a, you know, as though it's a modification of this work by Duchamp. Um, right. Oh, uh, they, that's, kind of that that's the kind of stuff I love, and um, that's basically what reflects the uh, a lot of what was inside the store. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, one of our 
you know, from, I think we had uh, one of, I mean, we had, I think one of our most popular books was always, um, un, what's that, Un Sante Blanc, the, the Max Ernst uh, surrealistic novel, um, which is just basically a lot of people with bird heads, <laughs> but it's a great, it's a great uh, book of collages. But then um, just, I just, it, it started really, it was my personal library that just turned into um, and personal collection of art and personal um, interests that I, that were on the walls and, and experience I got from my travels and my education. And I just started putting it out externally and sharing it. and. It, that was that was what we were selling was the you know the 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 community and the 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 conversations and the experience and the environment and um, but obviously uh, the books were a huge part uh, aesthetically and and content wise um, and and it's cool you definitely know that part of um, you know art history. Um, and then X realism comes from that's even that's a very personal one was the first short story I got published that had any reviews. I was up in San Francisco and I was working um, with Mick Sweeney's when they first came out. So this was I was uh, I went up transferred up there in 2000. So this is early to like uh, 2000 2001 2002 that kind of time period. And uh, Dave Eggers was building um, 826 Valencia, and which was the front end it was a store and a nonprofit. And then the, in the back end was the offices for McSweeney's. So I was the only person there in the area. I happened to m move into an apartment a block away. And I looked in, walked in there and I was the only person that um, was a writer going to college for English Lit and was a carpenter. So that's how I got in with them. And I wrote the story, um, The Russian Clown. And uh, one of, in one of the reviews, this author described it as, um, he said, ex realism in a sense, they followed in the sense of surrealism or ex existentialism and saying, yeah, ex realism as uh, you're, you're, in reality, you're, it's not a, it's not like magical realism. The writing is, is and the, the uh, setting is deeply trenched in reality and our time, place, and epoch. But there was a literary style that could swirl and wander, and um, but it was always based in our real time, place, and epoch. So he said it was like uh, a divorce from reality, where you know it is better than you, anyone your own reality um, but you are at the same time separated from it and then at the uh, at the other end of it the other translation of it was x reality as an extraordinary reality it's reality but it's 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 the the description of it was extraordinary or extraordinary so then um I was like uh Oh, okay, you know, we have uh, existentialism, we have surrealism, and, and then now we have ex realism. Could I actually have, you know, something that is that I can expand on philosophically that is actually a, a, a type of literary or art movement? You know, I don't know if it'll ever go that far, but you know, that's where the name comes from, at least. And, and we still hold to that, and, and I mess with uh. You know the definition or the or a type of kind of explanation or manifesto of what ex realism you know has is or can evolve to be or morph into but that's where it comes cool. from yeah so at first it was look books and the nonprofit was the ex realism project um so all the events we did were supposed to be under the ex realism project but people always call it look books and I didn't mind. I liked. I kind of like that. Same way. There's uh, bars that are called the office. I think people like that kind of um, ironic juxt juxtaposition that there would be a legitimate 
kind of underground show, but we're going to the bookstore, but it was a venue and, um, or it was a nonprofit that was doing a lot of, lot of extracurricular work than just being a bookstore, but just to call it look books. And so I didn't, I didn't fight it. And yeah, I, I, it. I like that idea. A couple of my best friends got married in a bookstore, which I think is, yeah. was a cool, a cool uh, idea. Uh, I don't know many people who do that. But. And that's what uh, people got, a couple people got married at our bookstore because we just created this environment. We had indoor and outdoor patio and everything was uh, just our interior design and exterior design was all functional, but very, very, you know, creative. Even our, we had our whole wall 40 feet, 45 feet length of, um, from, from ground to the roof was shelving stocked always full stocked of books and it was a free 24 7 free library people donated a lot for to help for maintenance and lighting but it was um fundamentally it was a free community library but it looked beautiful too because you come from the street and you see um you know a whole wall 45 foot long just filled with books and so that was that was neat um, and that was also up here. That was a hard thing because I've merged or partnered with a large nonprofit with a board of trust board of um, directors, and to try to translate that we were more than just a bookstore, it took a while for them to understand that we were actually a cultural center and and not to them just quote unquote a bookstore, um, which even. I took offense to that because I don't think that there is just bookstores, but even if that is all we were, we wouldn't have been just a bookstore in my mind. So. Okay, so we're in, you know, so you've got the store in Carlsbad and then, you know, what's the next stage? Oh, yeah. Okay. So then what happened was uh, I had, uh, we were there for uh, overall, we were there for about a decade, um, but that was online warehouse evolution to building and opening and um with the original landowner and my house was also on the same property so uh and i, I got the shop first and then two years later I, I leased the entire property and got the house and then about two years after i leased the entire property i signed a contract for first right refusal and basically leased to own with the first right refusal with the original landowner um and then about uh, a year and a half ago uh, um the son took over and uh we were going actually going through a phase of preparing for renovations and expansion and renovations and doing it, getting our permits, paying for permits, paying for materials, did a few renovations already, uh, put a new roof on and, um, and this is all with, in agreement with the, the son, the new, the new transitioning landowner. Um, and we were having some problems, uh, but everything was going through. And then just out of left field, I get a 60 day notice to vacate my business and my home. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had invested well over $50,000 just in materials. Um, and then you could obviously do the math on the labor to that. And we had just gotten to the point where we were uh, firmly established and recouping in both in rep like our reputation and financially as a, a established per place. Um, and we and it was just before that notice we were, you know, looking at this, everything's great and growing and it's going to get bigger and better and, and just we're going to be able to help more people. We were doing a lot of community outreach and it was going, our, our nonprofit was going international and then we lose our home base. Um, what was he planning to do with it? What has he done with it instead? Well, uh, unfortunately I have to be careful because um, yeah. we have uh, NDAs, non-disclosures. Um, so I have to be careful, but um, 
I honestly don't know. Uh, he they own the whole corner lot, which is on the main street, and it's two two large lots. So you have to figure that they would are going to. And Carlsbad's been um, tearing down buildings and redeveloping the those three to four story, you know, sh like shop and 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 condo places, literally every block in the village. So I have to believe that that's coming soon. But to my surprise. I, I figured the the place and my house and that back shop would be remain abandoned for about four and a half years until the leases came up on the front properties. Um, but actually, from what I've been gotten pictures and sent from my friends and family is that they have been um, uh, doing not deep renovations, but basic cleaning and some small renovations to rent it out as just a, a home and and uh, I don't know what they're if they're going to do with the with the commercial space uh, so that was surprising because they it was obviously I guess that's the most I could say as far as the NDAs goes that it I, it was I believe it was personal because um, it doesn't make sense any otherwise we weren't given the option to um, you know negotiate a different price a new pharaoh rose that knew not Joseph. <laughs> yeah. So we were looking in Carlsbad, and the problem was there was that spike. I mean, it was always growing, and and but there was a huge spike in the last, I'd say, even. I mean, it's hard to say when because it's been going and going, and going and going. Mm -hmm. But really, over the at least the last five years, you see on on the streets a massive spike of, of development. Um, and so to rent, to lease a place the size we needed would have been, you know, somewhere between 10 and $20,000 a month or to buy was the place we were looking to buy. They wanted, they asked for a million for, at the same time I needed to get a home too and buy a home. And so trying to buy a home and lease a, a commercial space that was enough for a venue and a bookstore and, co and coffee shop um, was not an easy task in um, coastal San Diego County. Um, so also, even if we could, we knew we were gonna barely scratch by and we were really big on uh, the nonprofit and helping people and getting funding to help people and if we were to do that, so much of anything we could do to generate in, in any kind of funding would be going to our overhead. So we wouldn't be able to do what help what was our what our primary mission statement became to be, which was helping artists and, and individuals and organizations, you know, you know, do do something good and right, you know. By the way, before I forget, if you if there's a site where people can, um, you know, can donate to what you're doing, uh, you know, send me the link and I'll put it in the description. Definitely, uh, the website has a donation part, and and the only thing I have to say with that we definitely and and we are we are going to be working on the Astoria Armory, that, and they have a website which is just the AstoriaArmory.com. That's and so it's look look X realism at the Astoria Armory is where what will be um, and then our website is is lookxrealism.com and their website is the Astoria Armory.com and um, eventually their their website is a little static ours is not so static but also um, the, it's not complete because of what I mentioned before. As soon as my wife gets here in January, it should be building up. But um, yeah, that must be frustrating to be. Oh stuck yeah, in, stuck especially in especially because it's been. Oh, it's going to be resolved next week or next week and next week, and it's been months and months and months. If it would, if they would have said from the beginning it's going to be this many months, then we would have been working and preparing, yeah, doing out. things in between. Mm -hmm. But when you think it's going to be, you're going to come home every every two weeks or so, it just becomes somewhat of a paralyzing and defeatist and hopeless feeling after a while. But I uh, I, th I think we're I think we're pretty we we have attorneys, so I think we're pretty pretty clear on January. 
and, but we'll still, it's, there's a lot to deal with politically and with the pandemic. So we'll see. But uh, to get back to it, yes, the, um, there's definitely donations. And one thing about the donations that I'd like to share is uh, one thing that when we are do get the site um, completely revamped and, and, and updated, I should say, not revamped, but updated and get the nonprofit window open, um, we had already set up a program to show basic accounting because what I experienced getting into the nonprofit and dealing with charities and charitable organizations was how much corruption there was in it. And, and it, was, it was really disheartening for, to see. So we saw a, a lot of times that 80 to 90% of the money that was um, generated was, or say, you, you know, kept by and only 10 to 20% got to the, the person, place or cause that was organization that was necessary, that needed it. And I learned that you could, it for, you could, in with 10 or 20% of the funds, you could get 80 to 90% of the funds to the person, place or cause that needed it. You didn't need all the inflated um, executive payrolls. You didn't need the, not just the middleman, but the transitional man and the third middleman and the fourth middleman. It just went on. And, and then there was the, you know, the, the golden toilets and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was rampant, it, rampant or whatever. It's a Red Cross even. Even when they do good, there's still other areas where they've had problems. So what we want to do, what we are doing is we set up a site where when you for when especially when we have benefits and collaborate with a, another organization they have to sign an agreement to do the same that we're doing which is have basic accounting available that just has graphs and scales so in, in basic layman terms you can see where the money goes and also we put out there uh complete accounting so uh someone could even do forensic accounting on it if they needed to and see where every single dollar went so that they can see that it the the, the money went to where it was supposed to go and there and there wasn't people on the take on the way there um, and that's really important to us and we hope that that starts a trend with with nonprofits and charitable organizations that that they uphold to the same standards, NGOs across the board. It just kind of builds on that. Like if, if we can do it, they can do it. And just transparency is, and honest is the same as honesty. It's always usually the best way to go. If we can be honest and to be transparent, you know, it's, I think that's pretty, it, it, it's, it's a good, if you're doing a good thing, it's good things are going to happen. So. Yeah. And I mean, I'm involved with a nonprofit and, uh, of a, a very shoestring nonprofit, and you know, our um, our financial statements are, are very all encompassing. Uh, although they, you know, you know, they are you know, people's monthly salaries is are usually like you know something like twenty five dollars a month, fifty dollars a month, and so forth. So there's not you know there's not much opportunity for uh, uh, for corruption, even if we were so inclined. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's a tough one. Like I learned that even just learn it with the small businesses, it's a lot of work. So you know people do need to. Everyone does need to make a living, and and so they're, they're, people should get paid for what they're doing, especially the ones that are doing good work, like to, uh, helping each other. Also, and that goes along with the artists. Like they they really deserve to be able to make a living being artists, but they also have to you know, put in their dues and work hard and, and treat it with as much care and, and effort and practice and networking and experience. That's what we teach with the nonprofit is you can't just kind of proclaim you're, you're an artist or a writer and not do anything or, you know, those are why the, the, you have those, oh, it's a one in a billion chance because a lot of the, like you take a writer, it's very rare that there's someone that's actually doing their 10,000 hours, you know, and, and on, you know, to, to, to master their craft and then continue to practice and practice and practice and become actually a master and good at what they're doing. And then, and then there's always the absolute rare anomaly of that plus 
the extra special just gift and of that is just you can't teach and you can't learn just you have it or you don't but you can teach and learn practice and time and i think there's you will get something in return for that i think you could make it i call it i'm a working class writer i'm not uh i'm not famous and i'm not rich but i make a living and i take care of my family and my primary income is writing but i also have to diversify that was part of doing a bookstore was sub, uh, subsidizing my income and and then also trying to help subsidize other people's income like get, get making helping them make it get an income at, from their art okay so so how how do you get from uh carlsbad to astoria uh personal and professional both are kind of equal where uh i grew up I was born and raised in Carlsbad, um, spent most of my time, most of the time in Carlsbad, but I traveled extensively throughout the world, lived in uh, Czech Republic, lived in London for a while, uh, lived in, in Wicklow, a little town outside of Dublin for a while. Um, uh, let's see, lived in Brooklyn for a while. San Francisco for years, um, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, um, and and then uh, now we have an apartment in Moscow. So um, I, but Carlsbad was my hometown, and I was back there for quite a bit with my basically since my son just turned had his twelfth birthday. Uh, a couple of days ago on the 18th. So it was back for about 14 years. And uh, it wasn't, I, I was, I was burned out on cities from my travel. I didn't want to live in a city. And I, I was just being a little, I was just feeling pretty down about, there was a big move a few years before I opened up in Carlsbad to, to create to, for a community, to create the village, make the village a, a community friendly place. Um, but it ended up being a lot of kind of horseshit, I guess, a lot of bull, it wasn't true. There, there wasn't, they, it was still focused on um, legacy, not history, um, vehicles, not, not pedestrians, uh, tourists, um, and not a balance with, with, with locals. There's nothing wrong with tourism, but you got to balance. It's got to balance everything, um, and I just didn't see that happening. And it just was, it it was the the quality of life and the cost of living versus quality of life was just the balance, the the pros and cons. The, the pro, the pro, the the con list was just getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So when I had an opportunity to, um, well, when you know, under the, 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 there was a, there was a, a net positive to the, our, our, our notice to vacate. I should put it that way. Um, couldn't find a place that we could even afford $4 million for, for a, a building was, was not, not in our price range at the time. And oh, so, and then also personally, all those things I mentioned. And I sat on my porch. I lived in the village, and I was I stared at a out at a stucco wall across the street, and two trees that were butchered so much by the city just because. And they were the sidewalks bundling up, but instead of like taking out the concrete, they cut the roots of the tree. And you, you just seen this for years. You're know, like, my gosh, I, I just want to look out and see nature. Um, so that was where it was. Personally, I wanted to move to the countryside. And then, um, but I wasn't solvent yet. So I needed um, some kind of city and infrastructure. Um, so I started looking from Northern California up and long and short of it, I found a beautiful house and land in the countryside, three mi three, well, actually four miles outside of town. And then 
as I was honing in on this house that we have, it ended up being one of our potential lenders was on the board of directors for the Astoria Armory. We got to talking about that. And next thing we know, I'm in negotiations for um, not only a place for the business, but uh, a position for myself as their nonprofit kind of organizer, liaison, first consultant, but now it's actually in-house. And I, I was able to work our, our, our place and project into the, the mission statement of their nonprofit and the physical space. So we have basically the whole entire working on and confirming having the entire lower level, at least transitioning to the entire lower level. So we already have a, the largest space down below and the main entrance on the and on the Columbia River side, which is uh, important up here. And uh, I've never and been to a story of it. When I was a little kid, my family was planning to move there, and I can't remember why we were planning to move there, and I also can't remember why. Was well, it? It's beautiful. But I still, I still have sort of a you know, it's like a alternative yeah. universe where I you know where I lived there. Uh, I still feel the connection to yeah. it. Yeah, I almost. Oh, if you would have went. Well, I think the two simple, the simplest things about us, like the, at least downtown Astoria, is it is the oldest city in Oregon, and it is one of the third oldest port towns on the West Coast, entire West Coast. Um, so before Portland, Astoria was was the, the port center for, Colum for the Columbia River. Um, so from, I don't, it has a long history. Lewis and Clark ended here. Um, that's, where the, that's where the expedition ended. Uh, in fact, right across the, the river from me, like right out my window here, I could, if, I, if it was daytime, I could see Clapstop um, Fort, which was their last settlement. Um, and then in town, which is about four miles behind me, um it's really neat because you have the the architecture and structure of a, of a 1800s city you've got eight story 10 story 12 story buildings here uh my son calls it mini san francisco i mean you can it it looks and it looks kind of like uh mini san francisco it does it, but it, but really mini for my son it's bigger but it's very it's a small city but then population wise, it is a, it's a small town. So it's interesting. So, and they have preserved, um, it's lots of museums, lots of historical buildings, lots of, it's a, it's kind of like if at, you know, Georgia has Athens, uh, Kansas has Lawrence, you know, um, what's North Carolina has Asheville. It, it's one of those kind of places. Uh, so for that one, um, I've been to, I've been to Asheville. Yeah. So for Oregon, uh, Astoria is kind of, it has, at least it's definitely since um, what I know of it, what I see of it is building up and what I'm actually been asked by even the mayor who's on our board of, of directors is to help uh, artistic migration or the growth in that direction because it is an artist community uh, very much so and it's also very like family friendly and so you have a lot of these you know because you can buy a home for a reasonable price and so you have a lot of like really um you know nice families which was good for me because i have a young family and then also there's a lot of artists and it's really diverse where you have at first I looked in there, it looked like um, retired artists, like a lot of people my age that like maybe didn't think they made it really in their 20s. So they were and so they weren't New York or L.A. or San Francisco. They were, uh, so that concerned me for a second. But I, I see there's a lot more diversity than that going on. And so we have everything from our 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 gutter punks to our avant-garde and and we have a pretty good diverse uh like demographic of age so we have young artists and and young kids and young people and we have and we have um and we have it's, it's 
age-wise, it's very diverse. So other than that, it's not that diverse yet, though. That's Oregon, I think, as part of that. But um, I think for Oregon, we're 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 definitely on the the diversity side of it. What about you know Portland and then Astoria and then Eugene, something like that. By the way, while I think of it, if you uh, you know after this interview is over, if you can uh, pick any. Um any photos either of the old store or of the new one or both for me to throw up on here just let me know which or which um sure, sure. i will do that i'm going to interrupt this interview briefly to show some of those photos um i already threw a few photos in at the uh earlier on in the video but these photos are of the original store in carlsbad And these photos are of the new location of the Astoria Armory in uh, Astoria, Oregon. And at the end of the interview, I've also uh, stuck in a little uh, five minute video that Sean sent me about the um, uh, the reconstruction uh, of the uh, Astoria Armory, the new uh, new location. Uh, that's uh, a fun watch. So uh, you know, stay tuned at the end of the uh, at the end of this interview. It's, you know, it's like a Marvel movie. There's a um, not exactly an end credit scene, but a just before the credits scene. Um, there actually is a uh, there actually is an end credit scene of, as well, but it's uh, it's very brief. Um, I think that's my first end credit scene in this series, uh, in this on this channel. All right, so back to the interview. Anyway, so um, uh, you know, I don't know how much you can say about future plans, but uh, I know you mentioned that there's a possibility of of uh, having something new in in uh, in the San Diego area while also keeping the yeah location well everything is just going going as good as it can go up here considering uh the pandemic uh all the deals that I wanted to have for the business and the nonprofit have been green lit now it's just a matter and I was able to uh write and procure a couple significant grants still need more um so so that's gonna be an issue but resolvable it's just the the big question is the same question that everyone has with the pandemic you know when when are we going to get to what what's going to be sustainable and when and, and no one can answer that right now um but with that being said uh we're feeling pretty pretty stable up here and uh, I know that one of the best things that I've done is to just diversify and expand so that I'm not all my eggs in one, one basket, basically. So before it was just a want to have, to keep a place in our, our where we started. Um, now it becomes more of not just a want, but actually a very a practical and sensible idea. And also experiencing being away from the community connection and support we had and, and still have there. Um, you know, it, it's only been a few months and also the pandemic hit. So a lot of places are, are kind of not open and, and need support from their local community. Um, so the idea that we're, that's how you know we would be in the same situation isn't isn't uh, is less than unusual right now 
so um how that's evolved is at first it was like no way we can't do anything now it's like you know what actually i see how many people people not only do i see how much people appreciate what we did there people once we are gone really realize how much they appreciate what we offered which was because we really focused on giving people a place to commune and and that's what we need more now than ever it's a place to go and feel comfortable and and socialize and so when that is allowed because i'm at the point now where i'm a strong believer and and very very supportive and protective when it comes to covid but i have some serious issues with the pandemic related restrictions and policies so um and that's not a problem with california and even, it's very similar here in oregon too um so uh but what that has led to is um people reaching out about uh, more people reaching out about investing and helping open a place down there um and and i have made contacts here with uh you know investors potential investors to benefactors where it's uh we just have a, a more likelihood and it's more plausible to go ahead and along the timelines of the pandemic and probably you know slightly behind other businesses because we're going to have to start from i left inventory down there but as far as infrastructure and we're going to have to start from scratch so it's not just opening the doors so we have to you know find the right location but we're we're definitely um it's it's we're not on hold anymore we're we're actively seeking a location and um trying to make it work out so it so we, would you move back down there or stay up in oregon or would you divide your time or what i think uh, uh a little bit of both i think for at least for the beginning it would be um uh having a, a dedicated a store manager there or even partner in the area and then um and then just visiting and coming down and helping from a distance then then eventually um, um yeah um, sharing my time down there and up here and then who knows after that um yeah, so you might end up the head of a, cha a chain of bookstores. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. I, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, as long as it serves a purpose, like sure. Um, but uh, at, but yeah, why not? But uh, at least definitely the the two. I definitely want to do what we're doing, especially since we really focused on that cultural center aspect of it, mm -hmm. and and paying an homage to the 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 artistic and intellectual gathering but sharing that with everybody not 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 being elitist at all in that sense even in, in intellectual or artist sense there's no pretension with our place so everyone's welcome but i i really think it 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 had a home there and it is its home there so it, it needs to have a play, part of it needs to be there well, I hope I hope it I hope it materializes, and I hope I get a chance to visit it when it does. Yeah, I, I'm I'm certain it will. It's just a matter of 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 when. Yeah, and I think that's just and that's very directly related to the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I mean, these they are rolling out vaccines now, so you know, obviously, you know, not everyone's going to be getting them until yeah spring or maybe summer. Um, I know, and I just saw the news that they do the. They say vaccine, and then oh, and oh, we have a new strain, you know, coming from yeah, um, near, near London. Uh, so it's like who knows what you know, and then you get the conspiracy side of it. Who knows what's mm -hmm. going to happen? But yeah, so that's a tough one, and yeah, especially being a small business and being in a small business that has also never been a high margin small business of any kind anyway so it'll be interesting so your 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 store in the story is it open for people to enter or are you just um providing no 
it's not open that we can't we couldn't at the moment yet even right now because we went on that, that second wave lockdown uh yeah. for the winter so do you uh, you know, do you send up you do you have any order by mail stuff or or pick up stuff or just are you just shut down entirely uh unfortunately mostly because of the the, the whole the massive process of the relocation um which you know we weren't we started in august but i wasn't officially moved up here until september um so the the relocating my home and business and then having to renegotiate the terms of of the business and then having my wife who is my my partner on every level from my helping with family and my children to the business and art is um we've been on uh on a, on a giant on the great pause um so but starting actually this month in december we started actively making things happen so we expect to have um activity merchandise and some and some select books online available online and maybe even doing things instead of just trying because we're never going to be able to compete with Amazon and thrift books with the, the the middle market or the low market. So we will sell some of our rare and, and collectibles and high high end stuff online. And we might try things like uh, like a raffle, like have a, a rare book, but where you only have to put, you know, put in five dollars to get a raffle ticket to get a, 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 a five thousand dollar book or something like that. So for my viewers, if you're watching this in December, there's probably not much you can do. But if you're watching this, you know, uh, a bit later, uh, yeah, hopefully mid January and on, there's going to be stuff and more and more and more as we go. So if you're watching this in mid January 2021 or later, um, you know, there's a good chance there'll be um, uh, stuff you can uh, uh, you can get online there. And of course, if you're watching it a few months after that, you know, you know, then. Uh, we can hope that uh, um, you'll actually able to be to go into that store. And if, you, if you're watching this even yeah. later than that, you might have two stores. You could go yeah, in. Yeah. And, uh, We're, we will exist. We, we, we are existing. Yeah. We're definitely opening. We're opening and, here. Uh, and shows you, you know, shows you can attend and various events you can attend. And oh, it sounds like a really cool. Uh, yes, yeah, right now I'm editing uh, every every event we had from every lecture, every reading to every music performance. I I uh, filmed everything, and at least seventy five percent of them were filmed professionally. And so one of the things I've been doing that during the pandemic is uh, actually taking classes to really learn my Premiere Pro editing skills, put them to work, and been editing that footage together cool and be out online i'm very much an amateur when it comes to this stuff as you can tell from the you know from the fact you know i, mean, given, I like your background <laughs> well yeah but given you know given my laptop's limited processing power uh you know weird things happen with the edge of my yes yeah, my head when i move around the uh zoom's not sure how much how much part of me is um how much of that stuff is part of me and how much is part of the background so it keeps appearing and disappearing yeah. and right now my hair is longer than it's ever been i've actually got it clipped back now but i haven't had a haircut since march uh which is a yeah, long you're doing your long. doing your covid no cut your your yeah. covid cut or not yeah, i'll show you i'll show you, the, show you with uh yeah this is actually well some of the longer it's actually longer than it looks now because some of the longer part is not is not showing up. Zoom thinks that it's not part yeah, of. It. Okay. I can, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, it's, 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 it's really, you know, it's really irritating. So, it keeps you know, bothering. Yeah, me. I've been going through that with my editing, with photos and video too, where you're trying to get that to, and it will, what you know, you try to do the auto auto erase or or add, and you're like, nope, that's not part of that. And anyway, that's what's behind me is um is the Ocean Beach Pier in San Diego. Oh yeah, I recognize uh, it right away. It's, it's near, you know, near um near where I lived in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, I knew I knew exactly where you where the background was right away. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm I'm pretty new to this video editing stuff, but I because uh, so because a lot of the classes we're teaching have been moved online and I had to, you know, you know, yeah, you know, acquire some minimal confidence. 
and yeah, I just, so I that, just that, got... that was why I decided to start a YouTube channel because I'm I'm doing stuff with Zoom anyway with my classes, and so I thought it would be cool to to have YouTube channel where I um, interview people and also you know sound off on crap I want to sound off on and various things. Yeah, I didn't realize we we're gonna we're you're doing that. I would have uh, dressed for the occasion. You know, I'm in my pajamas and my and my hoodie, but. Uh, um, yeah, I've been doing the same thing. I actually for my son's birthday, he's he's got a high end like PC, PC desktop for his gaming, and then we just I just got him for for his birthday a really nice like I I think I should uh, I should try to acquiesce it for myself as a, a nice mic for gaming or podcast or you know for him but it's gonna he's working on being a YouTube gamer on YouTube. But we got the boom mic and, uh, you know, I tested it out, it's like, oh man, I need one of these actually. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty low tech. I've got, I've got a, you know, my web, my webcam that I had for with my desktop somehow stopped being compatible with yeah. my desktop. Um, so I'm doing this all on my laptop, which is part of the reason that the you know the processing power is uh, a little bit less, but um, yeah, yeah. See, that's where I'm at. I, I, for me, I'm a writer, so like I always am on laptops, and because uh, to me it's a it's a it's a typewriter with a screen. Um, but then both my wife and son are on big, powerful PC desktops, um, so that's why they do. Like my wife does all the website stuff, and she's she's an artist, but she's just the master of the back end and uh, programming and algorithms and and coding to the to the front end visual and design which is i and i have like not not even getting there at all um so but but i, I my i'm not a luddite not a and not a neo luddite um but uh i was a little resistant i i one of the reasons for the bookstore even was was because we were going in that direction as a society, I, I felt like we needed a place like an uh, intellectual salon or a cat. Your voice just cut out there for a sec. Your voice is still out. And we need to protect that. There, um, now, now your voice is back, but your, your voice went okay. out a bit. Oh, okay. I, where did we leave off on? There was, a... um, you know, you were just saying, uh, you know, you're not a luddite, you're not a neo luddite, but you, you wanted, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you wanted a was, space like a salon, yeah. uh, and then you're. I was just saying that, like, I wasn't against the technology, but I just saw the direction we're going. So I thought, in line with that, we needed to preserve and protect a space, uh, the the physical book and the physical space that bookstores. Um, what what they what they're here for what they what they do for people and that is something and that amazon cannot compete with i mean if you want if you want sort yeah. of stuff shipped you know with great rapidity uh you know yeah, sure independent bookstores to compete with that but if you but the um but if you're bundling the you know the the individual book with the experience of of the physical bookstore and you know and not just all the book events yeah. you have, but just the, the bookstore itself because you know bookstores are just I mean, to me, they're such cool places. I always want to, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I always want to, um, uh, when I visit anywhere, I always want to head and see the bookstores. Like what's, what started this yeah. whole San Diego series of bookstores that I'm doing, um, and this is the second video to go up, I just did the one on Mysterious Galaxy. Um, but I've got some other people lined up. But the, uh, was, um, you know, I was, you know, out of nostalgia, I was watching some, some San Diego travel videos, and they were all about beaches and restaurants and and parks and shopping malls and things. And I have nothing against any of those things, but yeah. I couldn't find very many on bookstores. Uh, and I think a lot of people have the impression that San Diego isn't really a you know bookstore bookstore kind of place. But yeah, I know I know a, it's interesting. No, so there's been some great there. ones throughout history, and there there's great ones that are still exist that have been there a long time, and there's some great, relatively new ones. Uh, um, what's the name of the bookstore in La Jolla? Like uh, DG Wells, and he's been there for a long time. Yeah, 
Oh uh, yeah, I've, um, uh, I've I've been talking to him, uh, having some trouble getting coordination there, but I'm trying yeah. to. Um, there was when I was a kid. There was a great the bookstore, classic bookstore, coffee shop, but it, it was pretty like family friendly. But by the by the freeway in La Jolla on the on, on the east side of the freeway, I forget what they even called it, but it's kind of like one of those panicking bookstore type places they had. But that was there for a long time, and then that, that was gone. But then even that now, was weird. Um, in the seventies, there was the I think it was John Cole's bookshop in La Jolla, which is which is now is like a cultural center or an art center or something, right on the main. Yeah, and there was a yeah. couple of pretty pretty iconic like cultural center type bookstores in Hill Hillcrest. And, and the, it was downtown. There was something called Herwig or something like that, which was this. Um, there's this amazing place. You ask the you know you call and ask the owner, do you have? And then you 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 give like the first two or three words of the of the um, the title, and he'd say yes. Um, yeah, that's how I used to be in the beginning when I when I was shelving everything myself. I could I was like I knew I would knew, knew exactly where every book was. But I think her was the name of it, but that, that's long gone. Um, but John even verbatim now, ver verbatim books seems like a great place in in San Diego, like. And, um, yeah, they're on, they're on my list. Uh, um, but I haven't you know, haven't lined up anything. I haven't lined up an interview with them yet. But uh, and then I know Galaxy like they're not aesthetically so much, but they do amazing stuff. They're they they have great books and they do amazing. They do a lot of good. And they do good. a lot of you know they do a lot of events. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, formerly in house, but now you know, now online events. Yeah, uh, yeah. For the duration of the pandemic. Yeah. So that's our neck. That's basically what we're gearing up through this month and 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 through January is to go ahead and accept this online dynamic, which which was interesting though because I mentioned before with the, some of all those lectures and readings, one of the things we did was, and I think this is actually important with the main part of the story was, uh, um, because of that hit in the publishing world or in the economy in two thousand eight, but the you know with on top of that was the digital hit on music and 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 literature and the publishing world and since the publishing world was obviously smaller then the hit was even hit felt worse so what was happening is you know uh writers were getting like their advance offers were literally 10 percent of what a, a standard offer advance was before 2008 uh, it went from a hundred grand to ten grand for for a, a, a top publisher, you know, advance, and then also uh, no Tory, the publishers can afford to put any authors on t on uh, t any tours. So one of the ideas was like this is pre pandemic was let's we have the technology now let's put up a big screen. Let's have someone from New York, and, and the way I pitched it to um, um, established artists, anywhere from a, a, a best-selling author to um, an art, a visual artist, even a director or an actor, that was a top tier. I was saying it's so convenient; you can do it literally from your toilet. You can sit on your toilet on your phone, and you can and give us fifteen minutes. And then to the other one is like you you can be in New York and you don't have to travel here. You don't have to stay in a hotel. We don't have to pay for a hotel. You don't have to do anything. You can just be on like this, but you're going to be on screen. And the difference though was that you're on screen, but you were interacting with a live audience that was in the and so there was a mix where it was this, but you also had a live audience and it was streaming at the same time and recording. And then we filmed the audience too. And then and then if we had everything lined up, then you could also log in and interact from like like this too. But then there were the prime part was the 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 person on stage on either even if they are on screen and then a live audience. But we, but everything else, we we were using the online technology to 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 interact and to have an author. We had an author read live from Syria, and um, you know, actually we had one event where 
The opening author uh, was in London. Uh, the publisher who hosted the event was on an island in Greece. And then the, the main author was in Syria. And we, we did a test run and figuring out all the time zones. And during the test run, a mortar shell went off in Syria, like 30 feet away from the guy, like uh, in another home. And he acted like it was no big deal. Um, didn't happen in the actual event, but it, it happened in the, the, the test run. But and so we were doing that. And so it's kind of strange that we haven't done anything during the pandemic, but again, it was because of the relocating and just negotiating everything. And, and one yeah. silver lining of the pandemic is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of stores have learned how to do some of the suggestion stuff that they haven't before. Yeah. Even after the pandemic, they might, they might then do a, a mix of distance stuff and in person. And I think that's important because that's yeah. what I learned. Yeah. And that's how we were growing in a time when businesses were failing. We started and and during that, you know, yeah, in 2008 was when we were, we were starting stuff. Um, and we grew because it, we learned to mix media, mix styles and work, use online, but not be dependent online. And and just you know have the events but not have them be background have them be center stage when they happen um, and and rent out the space it's, so we created a beautiful environment and then so if we knew that hey every tuesday it's really slow or every monday why don't we rent out the space for a a, a french class because the environment like to them was like a french cafe they could hang out and so we just started doing things like that and, and it worked. Um, so I think that was re really important that because, and even now what we're doing here is we're creating a, um, a, an, a literary museum. So we have, uh, right now we're starting off with where we have the, some of the rare, you know, true first editions that we have, we have on display at, at like a museum, just as, as a museum and we even have uh, authors, they're t like James Joyce's typical setup and Hemingway's podium and typewriter. But right now they're the same typewriter and the same podium and, you know, the same desk and the same typewriter from anywhere from Hemingway Joyce to William Burroughs. But eventually the goal is to actually have their actual desk and typewriter. And, and have it on display like a museum. But right now we're, we're um, setting up displays that uh, replicate replicas. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's that transition, there's that mix too, where it's a museum that you can also buy something from too. Like take that museum piece off the shelf and buy it. So just right. kind of, you know, I, cause that's another thing that's important. Like. The bookstore itself is is historic and important and valuable and something that needs to be preserved. And I think that's been the main theme, I think, through most of what I've shared, I think. Yeah. I think this is going to be one of my more interesting interviews. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm glad, you know, like, uh, just, that's why when you reached out, I was like, I, 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 I knew the how important it was just to share, you know, from communicate to, to, you know, press to media, any time, anything that you can share, anyone you can talk to any audience, it's good. It's good for everybody. So like, I, I definitely wanted to help, like wanted to help San Diego, wanted to help what you're doing. It helps what I'm doing. I, I don't see any negatives to doing stuff Thank like this. Yeah, at I, all. I hope, uh, I hope, you know, not that I have a huge audience, but I hope, you know, I hope that this, will direct some you know, more people to your to your sites and to what you're doing. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and, to, and, and everyone, we all have to start from somewhere and, and we can and we can start at any time. That's one great lesson I learned in my life when I was going through a great like romantic tragedy in my 30s. When, and I thought, you know, everything ended at, at 30, 30. I was coming into 30. I thought everything ended and I had a, a, a and you know, he was a, you know, a lifetime theater actor in San Francisco and he was in his eighties and, and his group of friends were all about the same age. And 
they truly taught me that as long as you didn't accept it, like life was an adventure the whole entire time and you could do whatever, live your life like a story and try as best you can. And that's kind of what X realism is about is try to divorce yourself from those oppressive type of things and then live an extraordinary life. And that could just be a, idea, a set of ideas like and so that to me that's something i still you know i have to keep practicing it but it's still a valuable lesson or mod even kind of a mantra that i have to remind myself of and a lesson and put it in but i remind myself with a little mantra like hey you can you know you never know what's going to happen you never know when it's going to happen but you do know if you don't try it's not going to happen so just keep hey, well, doing it well, thanks a lot this has been really fascinating and I might check back with you uh, again once you've got the, um, you know, once you've got the, uh, you know, the new store opened up or the old store opened up, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, best of luck. Yeah, I'd love to. Good. Okay. All right. I, I will do that and see what time is it. Um, I'll probably, I'll send you a couple pictures probably, t uh, probably later tonight or maybe tomorrow morning if that's okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. It was really great meeting you. You too. Best and I'm glad we did hook up because that was a while ago. And, and, and I, I could have just said, oh, no, I'm gone. I'm not there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'm off. Okay. Bye -bye. Really glad we chatted. Okay. Okay. Talk to you again. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, see you on email. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye. And here, as promised, is a brief uh, five minute video showing the reconstruction of the uh, new location of lookbooks at the Astoria Armory in Oregon. Uh, unfortunately, I have thought it prudent to strip out the soundtrack. Originally, it had a, a musical backing, but when worried about uh, uh, the, the video being taken down by uh, copyright hawks, and so I've I've removed that, uh, which uh, makes it somewhat less enjoyable. But um, you know, we live in a fallen world.
Okay, so that was uh, my interview with Sean Christopher of Look Books or uh, Look X Realism. Um, uh, if you, uh, you know, are uh, uh, watching this, um, you know, in 2021 as opposed to December 2020, which is when I'm, uh, which is when this will, uh, which is when this was interviewed, when this is recorded, and when it's going to go up. But if you're watching a little bit uh, later, uh, there'll be um, more stuff. On uh, online that you can um, uh, access from uh, from uh, his store, uh, uh, and um, if you're watching it, you know, still later in the year, um, there'll be still more, and there will likely be two stores, one up in Oregon, one back in in uh, San Diego again. Uh, uh, anyway, um, you yeah, know, so. Uh, um, this I, I think that his uh, his project really deserves a lot of support. Um, you know, so uh, and I think it's very interesting. So uh, check out the sites that I'm going to have in the description. Um, and I will see you next time.